Hi, everyone. This is Ruthie Rotenberg from the Jewish Funders Network, and I welcome you to our first webinar in our new um, PRI-MRI community of learning. We're going to have several webinars in series. Today we're very excited to have Deborah Schwartz from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, who is going to be doing an introduction to PRIs. Deborah has extensive experience in the field. She is the Managing Director of Impact Investments at the MacArthur Foundation. I want to just go over two quick technical things before I hand it over to Deborah. Um, if you could please mute your line with star six or your mute button, and any questions you have for Deborah, please put in the chat window. We're going to let Deborah go through everything. If you have questions along the way, put them in the chat window. If there's time at the end, she will hopefully get to all of them. Um, and I also will say that this webinar is going to have to end exactly on time because Deborah has another meeting she has to get to. So Deborah, thank you very much for taking the time to prepare this and share with us today. And I now want to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Ruthie, and it's great to join everyone. Um, I, I can see the start of a long list. Um, it's, it's always a little bit funny doing the webinars, but I'll, I'll look forward to seeing everyone's uh, questions and, and maybe at a future date being able to join some of you in person. Um, really excited to share this overview or 101 on investing for impact. Uh, as Ruthie mentioned, I'm with MacArthur Foundation. We've been making impact investments uh, in the form of PRIs. Uh, for 30 years, we've deployed $500 million, uh, mainly in the U.S., but also around the world. And uh, we are always delighted to share our experience, uh, any kinds of tools or guidance or advice that we can. Um, and we're just thrilled by the growing community and diversity of folks who are interested in uh, impact investing. We do have the ability to make mission-related investments, and in a minute I'm going to show you some diagrams that will hopefully parse a little bit of the uh, kind of technical confusion that can arise around all these different terms. So with that, um, I will make a shameless plug and say we hope you'll follow MacArthur at MacFound on Twitter if that's um, your bent, and I also can be followed uh, at Impact Banker. So I'm going to start by uh, just showing you a diagram I used to use when I would talk about impact investments. And if you're old enough, you will know that's a push-me-pull-you uh, from Dr. Doolittle Little Vintage. Um, I don't think that's a good picture anymore, and I've rejected it, and I'll show you another one in a second. Um, the reason I used to show that is because people say, well, uh, it's the push and pull of money and mission, of profit and purpose and that these things are in tension. And there are a lot of debates and conversations about whether or not if you make an investment that has a positive social uh, impact as its intention or a positive environmental uh, impact as its intention, uh, will you necessarily be in conflict uh, with the um, objective of earning money? So, like I said, I, I reject that as a kind of false dichotomy and instead have adopted the bicycle, which I hope all of you can see. And I've borrowed this from one of our most successful impact investment recipients, the Center for Community Self-Help. Uh, it's now a $2 billion community credit union headquartered in North Carolina, serving literally hundreds of thousands of people across the country with high quality, affordable financial products and services, home mortgages and auto loans and banking services and the like, as well as small business loans. And they look at this in this way too for their own organization, which is to say that the front wheel of your bicycle is your mission. You have to know the impact you're looking for, where your intention is, what are you motivated by, and that's how you steer your bicycle. And the money is what drives you forward. It's your engine. Um, that's true for any mission-driven nonprofit or business. And it's also true for our impact investments. If these things are in too much conflict, um, and there will always be some tension, but if they are in too much conflict, uh, you'll simply fall down. Now, 
I want to try to do this as a broad overview. And so here are just a few pictures from actual impact investments that we've made uh, in the not too distant past. And they capture some of the spectrum of what you can do with impact investments. Um, if you're looking at this screen, the upper left is actually a picture of a customer at one of the branches of the Center for Community Self-Helps Credit Union. Um, they have a very specific um, specialty around Latinos and immigrants and folks who are uncomfortable in traditional banking institutions and often fall prey uh, to bad actors of the, in the unregulated banking arena. In the center is a photograph from a children's theater here in Chicago, and we have a special arts and culture working capital fund that we created to give small arts groups the ability to get lines of credit to manage their cash flow, which can be a big challenge. On the right, our picture of children living in a wonderful rental housing community that was acquired and redeveloped and now operated by NHT Enterprise Preservation Corporation, a very large nonprofit for whom our investment helped provide startup capital. And today they operate more than 6,000 quality affordable rental homes across the country. Lower left is a picture from the Energy Savers program, making loans to small building owners here in Chicago, and it's being replicated in other cities, uh, loans that banks might find unattractive, but which are saving 20 to 30 percent on the utility bills and reducing the carbon footprint of some of the nation's least energy efficient buildings. In the middle is a child care center uh, developed by IFF. That's a community development financial institution here uh, in Illinois, now serving a 10-state region, providing specialty finance for nonprofits. And on the right uh, is a conservation project done by a group called EcoTrust out of the Northwest. These are just to give you a flavor for some of the many different things that you can help fuel uh, with a smart impact investment. The history of impact investing, some say, goes back to Benjamin Franklin, who created loan funds, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for uh, small businesses. And in the lower right is a picture of Henry Ford. And some of you may know that the program-related investment tool, which we'll talk about in a second, was something really pioneered by the Ford Foundation uh, and was enacted as part of the tax code in the late 1960s. And uh, Ford and Packard are the only other two large foundations that have been using program-related investments for as long as MacArthur. Uh, today, we have 300 million uh, specifically designated for our impact investing work. Packard has 180 million designated, and Ford has 400 million. Now, those sound like large numbers, um, but the spectrum of what is impact investing and who is doing it is growing by the day. Uh, just yesterday, BlackRock announced that they are going to have an impact investing product. It's very different than what we do. Uh, it's going to be a fund uh, with lots of stocks in it, uh, companies that have been specially chosen because they have alignment with uh, some sort of environmental or social purpose. But today, we see everything from the Inter-American Development Bank calling itself an impact investor or OPIC. Uh, other foundations, big and small, community foundations are a very fast-growing part of our arena. Families, family offices, donor-advised funds, um, and banks of all kinds. Goldman Sachs acquired a specialty firm uh, in the summer that focused on impact investing and so on. And my little icons on the bottom just reinforce the point I made a second ago, which is you can touch on almost everything that you can imagine from healthy food to, to health care itself to arts and energy and conservation and human services through your impact investments. And I apologize for going quickly. I hope you can follow me. Um, I do want to make sure we leave some time for questions. Um, I just share this slide because I know we all get swirled up in the bazillion different terms that are out there, and they're sort of all overlapping. They do mean different things, and we'll talk about the one term that actually is legally codified, which is program-related investment. Um, but all of these things in some ways are now starting to smoosh together under the big tent uh, that is called 
uh, impact investment. And I, I see a little thing, Ruthie, that says David Schwartz has his hand raised. Um, I don't see anything in the chat box. I'm going to look at the questions. I don't see that. Yeah. Uh, Dave, um, just I almost to re-announce everyone. We're gonna, we have a lot of people on this call. If you have a question, if you could input it in the chat box. Yeah, so once you do that, then I'll know if I need to stop. I know I'm going pretty fast, like I said. But I'm going to keep going. Um, you know, one of the things that is the hallmark of an impact investment in our view is that there is a really deep intentionality about it. Um, this is not something that you do accidentally, and it's not something that the enterprise, uh, the, the impact is not accidental uh, either. Uh, David is asking a question, by the way, how do you make money supporting a theater company? So this actually fits perfectly into this slide. The idea of an impact investment is not to make money. The idea of an impact investing is to, uh, investment is to help accomplish a specific positive social, environmental, or economic objective. In the case of a PRI, it's to accomplish an IRS-recognized charitable objective. But the difference is that you are making it in the form of any of the things that are shown on this spectrum slide here. It can be a loan. It can be an equity investment. It could be a cash deposit at a bank. Uh, it can be a bond. And even in some people's uh, version of impact investing, it could be a public equity a position in a stock. Depending on the nature of the enterprise, uh, the return that you may get may be quite modest. So our arts and culture loan fund here in Chicago provides critically needed resources to arts groups by partnering us with a conventional bank that would not normally be willing to make those loans under any circumstances uh, because their organizations are quite small and they're not very financially savvy and they lack collateral. They don't have assets to pledge behind their loans. So what we are able to do is successfully make the loans, have a small rate of return, partner with a bank who has much more capital to provide than we do, um, and allow those theater companies to access the kind of financing they need uh, to grow their and operate their enterprises. So the objective is not really making the money, um, but we do believe, and I'll talk a little more about the benefits of complementing your grant making uh, with this type of activity. Let's just dive in for a minute into the definitional piece because that also will shed light on how all of this uh, kind of fits together. So this is a diagram showing um, the conventional model for how we think about accomplishing charitable outcomes as a foundation. We have a pool of investment assets, sometimes known as the corpus or the endowment, uh, in the case of a private foundation. And I want to be clear, this is a model that is not representative even of community foundations. This is strictly about um, private foundations as they are defined in the tax code, and MacArthur is a private foundation. In the conventional model, we take our investment assets and we invest them, as you see over on the right, into a whole array of different kinds of asset classes. And it might be real estate assets, in the transportation sector, in the financial services sector, and so on. Technology is not on this list, but it could be. Oh, there it is, information tech. And we earn a variety of returns, and then we use the returns on those assets up above to make grants. And those grants need to qualify under the IRS definition of being a charitable distribution if they fit within the IRS definition of charitability. And we refer to that distribution as the quote-unquote payout. And the IRS rule says you need to make a minimum of distribution of 5% of your assets each year, although it's slightly more technical when you think about how it's calculated. In this slide, we've now added program-related investments to the right of grants. And PRIs are indeed the only legally defined form of an impact investment. It is technically a term that only applies to private foundations. So if you're just an individual or a donor-advised fund or a community foundation or a corporate foundation, you may not, in fact, be uh, really able to make technically a program-related investment. The idea of a PRI is that you're allowed to do something with your assets that's quite unusual and maybe too risky to do with your normal assets because private foundations are prohibited 
from knowingly making jeopardizing investments. That's the technical term for things that run afoul of, of um, just good, prudent stewardship of your assets. So program-related investments are allowed to be rather unusual and unconventional, and in fact, the way that the rules are written, they have to be a little bit unusual, and that's how you prove to the IRS that actually your principal goal is to achieve your charitable purpose. You do have to be inside the lines of what the IRS considers charitable. It's not just something you feel good about, um, just like with your grants. And it counts toward your payout in the year that you distribute a PRI. The difference is you'll see a little blue arrow dashed coming back from the PRI to the investment assets. So the difference with a grant, you go one way. You distribute it to the recipient, and you're done. With a PRI, you set it up so that if it's a loan, you provide it to the recipient, they use it for the intended purpose, and then they pay it back to you, typically with some amount of interest or return. The difference is that, again, uh, for the IRS definition, it often means that that return is quite a bit less than what you might expect uh, in a conventional investment setting. And for our purposes, the reason that's great is it means we can accommodate the specific challenges of nonprofit organizations and others that might not be able to successfully use conventional investment dollars. And this last two slides just show you what MRIs are, and the difference between MRIs, mission-related investments, and PRIs is this. PRIs, again, are this defined thing under the tax code that you distribute and for which you receive charitable distribution or payout credit. MRIs are something you do with your corpus, with your investment assets, and it just means you have a higher degree of an intentionality with those around the positive social benefits you want to accomplish than with the rest of your investment assets. So that's what's in the lower green gray box to the right. You might do them to support affordable housing or clean energy. Importantly, those MRIs cannot be jeopardizing. They cannot be imprudent investments. And during the q and I'm happy to speak to some of the new regulations that just came out from the Treasury around MRIs for anyone who's interested. But that might be a, one, a 201 conversation. And then finally, I'll just say that for some people, MRIs and PRIs uh, can also be accompanied by what's called an all-in approach, which is to say you not only make some affirmative investments that further your um, environmental, social, and economic interests, but you may also actively screen out things that you believe run counter to those philanthropic or social objectives. And so that's what my little red and blue box is trying to say, that you're actively screening out things that you don't want to invest in. And the most prominent thing today is the climate um, and fossil fuel divestment movement. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this slide, and Ruthie, I don't know if you'll be able to make this deck available to your participants and members, um, sure. but this is just another way of visualizing what I just showed you, which says that there's really a spectrum all the way from tr traditional grants that by definition have no uh, investment return, all the way to conventional investments and everything in between. I'm not wild about the terminology of below market to market rate return. We, I would use a more nuanced language today, but that sometimes is a helpful way for people to think about this. I want to quickly, before we uh, open it, things up for questions in about six, seven minutes, I want to just take a little bit of a deeper dive into why we do this kind of investment work and where it applies. First of all, it's only going to make sense with organizations that actually have a revenue generating business model. I mean, if the organization is, let's say, pursuing advocacy work, um, there's really not a stream of revenue that pays them for that work. 
Um, now, they may have a side business uh, for which they earn revenue. Some nonprofits, for example, do human services delivery but also have consulting, or I've even seen they have employment agency kinds of arrangements. So it's very useful for things that look like a social enterprise that have a revenue model, earned income, um, and it's that income that then you look to to repay the financing. There has to be real management and organizational capacity, or again, this tool is not particularly useful. And I, and I want to really be cautious that um, the, uh, the goal here is to strengthen and build organizations. The goal here is not to make an investment, just to make an investment. This is intended to be an extra tool in your toolbox that can expand and deepen the impact of your philanthropy and your mission-driven work. There does have to be a workable legal context if you can't do uh, enforceable contracts. So in some developing countries that's the case, or where political environment is super unstable, um, this is not going to make a lot of sense. So a war-torn nation may not be the place that you, you start with your uh, impact investing work. You have to know something about the sector that you are in because by definition, you are likely doing things that regular investors deem too difficult, too costly, uh, too inefficient, or just too financially unattractive to do. You're filling a gap. And so that means you need to know something and have partners who know something that allow you to be successful uh, in this work. And I think we always operate with the assumption that the market is actually pretty smart. And so if there's a reason that capital is not reaching the enterprise you're trying to help, whether that's a nonprofit or a for-profit enterprise, um, you should really be thoughtful about what those reasons are and make sure that you actually are the one or your partners are the ones that are equipped to do something about it. There needs to be knowledge, partners, and opportunity. And finally, for us, we really look at this as a way to build entire sectors and have disproportionate impact um, often through policy change. So our work in affordable rental housing, which again I'm not going to dive into today, um, has been an example of that, and we have a forthcoming study about that 15-year initiative coming out uh, next year. I mentioned the concept of gaps before, and that's a big idea for us, that, that impact investments are a way of bridging gaps between the capital that an enterprise, and I'm going to reinforce this, nonprofit or for-profit, that an enterprise needs to do its work and fulfill and achieve its mission to get started, to innovate, to grow, and succeed. And there can be many reasons why uh, capital doesn't flow. It can be that the enterprise is too new. It can be that the market itself is too new. And if we think about some of the innovation going on in clean energy, um, that could be an example. It could be that the policy environment is so uncertain or difficult. Doing work in low-income housing and low-income child care, for example, means you have to understand the subsidy regimes that help make those properties and operations succeed, and that's complex. There can be constraints because uh, to the earlier conversation, the organization may have very constrained profit and revenue. It may be a very bespoke or, or unconventional operation. It's a hybrid, public-private kind of enterprise. And it may be small, which means inherently then the investment uh, work is inefficient or costly because it's not a scaled investment, high transaction costs. We tackle these challenges in many ways with our impact investments. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the big advantage of an impact investment, especially if it's a PRI, is that we can absorb risks that create barriers for others. And then we bridge the gap and allow others to come in and partner with us because we've turned an investment they might not be willing to do otherwise into something that works. And that's where we have really outsized impact, where we leverage lots of other capital from other sources. The, the 
facets of our impact investments can vary. We can be below cost pricing our interest rates. We can be extra patient, which can be very helpful. We might accept an investment without any collateral, which can be helpful. We might allow it to be used for something that normal investors would find unusual. And we might be willing to be subordinate, meaning have a position that exposes us to loss before the other investors. These, along with the effort and the persistence and the relationships that we bring, make our impact investments have the kinds of results that we're looking for. These are just a couple final thoughts about some of the success factors. You do really need to be willing to invest or harness the knowledge you have in a particular geography or with a particular group of people or a particular kind of work. Partnerships are just key, um, as they are in all aspects of philanthropy and successful social change. And a big one for us is to be what we call problem first and tool second. I think where this falls apart is when folks start by saying, I want a, a five-year loan that's going to give me a low-risk 7% rate of return, and I'm going to end poverty with that. Well, you just started with your tool, the, the kind of loan, the kind of return, the kind of duration that you want. And then what happens is the problem you want to address maybe isn't going to be solved. We start by looking at what's the issue? Is it trying to unlock capital for an arts group in Chicago or for land conservation or for building schools or financing auto loans for immigrants? And from there, we do the problem solving to figure out what's the right way to use our flexibility and creativity to, to bridge the gap. Um, that's why I often say that scaled and successful solutions to really deep capital gaps need to be made, not found. I'm not of the opinion that you know, all investment, impact investment is about is just looking really hard. In our experience, there has to be some real hands-on work that somebody's prepared to do uh, to bring the capital markets together uh, with the organizations that need that resource on the right kinds of terms in a fashion that really works. We also like impact investment because it's an efficient way to use some of our resources. If it does make sense, it can be a way to have capital that recycles, which is different than grants. It can allow for proof of concept, and then the enterprise can go on to get money from others. It can help strengthen an organization. It creates um, visibility to the business model and the thinking and the management, and it engages us in a whole different kind of conversation with our uh, capital recipients than a grant. Um, it can, as I've mentioned, allow us to de-risk an investment for others and crowd in other partners who might otherwise shy away, and it can be a, a fuel for building out whole sectors, like in affordable housing, uh, for example. There are some downsides. Uh, it can be difficult. I'm not going to actually uh, sugarcoat that. It's not as hard as people think, and I'm happy to talk about ways we can make that easier for anyone who's interested. Um, but at the end of the day, there are legal opinions that are required. There's financial analysis that's required. Um, and it's not um, helpful to do it in a casual way because you may uh, both undermine your own objectives and you may actually set an organization up to fail, and that's certainly not, that's going to be counterproductive. Social impact of the deepest kind is always difficult, and I think we always struggle in impact investing between the outcomes and the impact, and so it's no diff different here. Um, we, we often make our investments for 10 years, so you have to be prepared to be in it for the long haul, and that can be different than other kinds of grant making, and organizations get in trouble. And you have to be prepared for that, and things can really go wrong. And um, that's a challenge that you should be thinking about uh, before you dive in. But we think on balance, it's a wonderful 
adjunct to conventional philanthropy in the right circumstances for the right organizations. I'll just leave you with saying that in our affordable rental housing work, again in the upper right corner, we've provided capital to about 25 nonprofits around the country and a whole slew of specialized public-private funds, and we've unlocked over $15 billion of new capital from public and private sources over the last 15 years, providing improved, high-quality homes for literally hundreds of thousands of low-income seniors and veterans and the formerly homeless and families and people with disabilities. Um, and we've done all these things uh, by, you know, really applying our capital in a focused and creative way. And I uh, am a believer in this instrument when it produces those kinds of results. It is not a substitute for grants. Uh, it is an adjunct. Um, there's some examples here that I'll leave you with. It can be a loan for a specific project. You could be making a loan to a nonprofit or a business. You can make an investment. You can put your money into a loan fund or a credit union. And those are often easy ways to get started. And you can also provide guarantees and help others uh, decide to make loans because you are willing to take some of the risk. So that's it for my run through. I'm sorry, I'm at four minutes past the top of the hour. I see some questions. I'm going to try to scroll up if I can figure out how to do it. Do you want me to field the questions for you? Um, I think you better because I, I can see the questions. But um, let me see. Maybe I can figure out. No, I can't figure out how to scroll up. Yeah. So the uh, first question we have, if you make an MRI and, quote, make money, do you mm -hmm. have to give out that amount over and above the 5%? 5 per, 5 Great like question. On PRI? No. So an MRI is truly not really a thing. It's just a way of sort of thinking about your investment or endowment assets. And so if it's truly an MRI and it's just part of your corpus, the income, either capital gains or the interest earnings or dividends, is just like any other income stream that you have on your regular endowment. So what does happen is that filters into and builds up if you're, if you're making overall progress and building your endowment over time, when you calculate what your 5% payout is, right, it's always based on that total pool of investment assets. So indirectly, but that's no different than how any investment would affect indirectly over time. If your endowment grows, and that would be including your MRIs, over time, your payout distribution would grow in dollars. And if your endowment shrank, your payout requirement would shrink. Does that, uh, can you ask the person to type whether that answers the question? Hopefully that answers, if you can. Can you say yes or no? The, yeah. <laughs> and so another question, can you provide suggestions or tips for piloting a PRI for the first time? Yeah. I think, you know, one of the very best ways to do this is to first of all not get involved in doing lending directly with individual projects. And in fact, it's our sort of guiding principle that we always look first to see if there is a specialized uh, intermediary of some kind that has the right kinds of expertise. So, you know, I've mentioned child care centers a couple of times, so let's take that as an example. I don't want to try to figure out whether or not a specific child care operator has a great plan for this wonderful facility that's in a community that maybe I really care about as a funder and I want to see that facility go in, or maybe I'm really focused on early childhood. So I really want to help that facility take shape. But I don't know if they've done it right in terms of projecting their, you know, the built construction costs. Do they have it right in terms of thinking about the subsidy streams they're going to pull in? And have they modeled it all out correctly? The good news is across the country there are these things called CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. That's a treasury certification. There are about 800 of them across the country. If you want to know more to find them in your area or in your area of interest, um, you go to opportunityfinance.net, and that's the network of CDFIs, and they can come in the form of loan funds and credit unions and venture funds and banks. 
and many of them have specialty areas around things like low-income child care, like charter schools and education finance. Um, there's increasingly a lot of work, for example, in healthy food and financing. And I would look for a loan fund that has a track record and has good staff, and you would make a loan to them. And then they would do the actual project lending. If it's a credit union, it's incredibly easy because you can just put a deposit and the same thing for a community bank. And again, if you've asked a question and I've now rattled off an answer, if you want to um, type a yes or no uh, Deborah, or follow can up. you also address the new regulations that came out briefly of course. that I know yes. got a lot of people a little bit nervous about this? Well, actually, we, I hope it, it got the opposite effect. So the IRS um, did release some anticipated uh, clarifying information about MRIs, about mission-related investments. Now, again, I want to be clear. Mission-related investments are not a designated term in the tax code the way PRIs are. PRIs were added in 1969. They are a specific exception to Rule 4944. That's the rule that prohibits a foundation from knowingly making a quote-unquote jeopardizing investment with its endowment. Jeopardizing investments are relevant here because the whole reason some foundations may have been nervous about making MRI investments was if it wasn't a PRI, meaning it wasn't a, a clearly charitable purpose investment with clearly other kinds of characteristics that made it a PRI, it started to be in this fuzzy gray space. And there were folks worried that if they did an MRI and it was too funky, right, it would run them afoul of the jeopardizing investment rules. And so people who are big proponents of MRIs felt that that lack of clarity was holding people back from using their endowments, not just to make PRIs, because that's, that's actually pretty straightforward and we've got a you know, long set of precedents and we have a lot of history there, but people felt that MRIs were being kind of suppressed by the unease people felt. Now, it's important to understand the regulation clarity that came out is not a panacea and it's not um, a wide open door that says you can now do anything you want with your endowments. In the simplest term, here's what it said. If you make an investment out of your endowment and that endowment satisfies applicable state and federal regulation regarding prudent management of endowments, then you do not need to worry that that, in, that investment could separately be deemed jeopardizing under this 4944 rule that applies to private foundations. Essentially remove this idea of double jeopardy, that somehow you might make an investment and it would be considered prudent in every regard, but the IRS would come and play gotcha with you and say, no, that was a jeopardizing investment. It said one analysis is going to be enough. Now, the good news of that is that the laws around prudent investment have increasingly come to incorporate some acknowledgement of mission, of mission alignment, as being a factor that an endowed institution can take into account when it makes an investment. But it is very important to remember that that is only one of many, many factors on the list. And that's why I say it's not a, you know, a wide open invitation to do anything you want. Just because the investment is mission driven and mission aligned doesn't make it prudent. You know, so if the investment is not prudent, it's not going to be allowed under the prudent management applicable statutes and regulations, and it's not going to be allowed under the jeopardizing investment rule either. So the bottom line is, yes, you can make MRIs, but you still need to apply a screen because they sit in your endowment. You still have to apply prudent investment uh, analysis. The good news is you don't have to worry about there being one set of standards for that and a separate set for the jeopardizing investment rules. They've been, they've been basically, that issue has been put to bed. Um, 
turns out that most of the attorneys working with foundations doing MRIs had already reached that conclusion that you shouldn't have to worry about that um, kind of double analysis. So I hope that is, is somewhat clarifying. Thank you. I, there's another question I missed from the beginning um, related to your example from a theater company, and it was how yeah. do you make money supporting a theater company? So again, uh, what I tried to say earlier on is the issue is not making money. It's a different question. It's how do you help a theater company with a financial instrument and not just a grant? Why would you even need to do that? Why not just give grants? And the answer is this. Because theater companies are businesses, even if they're nonprofit, and they are businesses that happen to have a great deal of cash flow challenges. And I, I know this personally because my husband, uh, for 30 years, has been a theater photographer for nonprofits in Chicago and the Midwestern region. Um, and he, he is the one who experiences the cash flow challenges of nonprofit theaters most directly. So they need working capital loans. They need a loan so that they've uh, secured all these subscriptions and pledges, but they've got a show to put on and they don't have the cash to pay for the sets and the, and the actors and the so forth and the rent. And they also may not own a building and they may have no capacity to pledge any kind of collateral, you know, any kind of assets. Like when you get a home loan, you have a house and you pledge that, but they don't have any assets. So they're very, very unattractive for normal banks to work with from a working capital standpoint. So that's an example where being willing to provide those loans because we're confident that those theaters are doing a good job running their operations and that they're going to be able to successfully manage credit and recycle that credit and borrow it and pay it back and borrow it and pay it back and use it to bridge those cash flow gaps. Why would you give them a grant for that? Because in part, you almost want right to build up their reputation as a credit-worthy borrower because hopefully over time, some of them won't need your help anymore. They'll be able to go to a bank and say, look, I have a five-year track record. I've been using this credit line successfully. Now you should just give me that product yourself. That's a perfect example of strengthening the organization, teaching it about using credit and what it looks like to write a proposal to a bank and fill out the application and then over time, helping them graduate to a more conventional source of financing. So, I, so it's, uh, we do require interest payments, but that's because you wouldn't be proving much to that conventional lender if the theater showed up and said, yes, I used credit, but I could never make an interest payment. So it's not going to be a way to make lots of money. This is not an enterprise that's going to have a high margin for you, um, but we can get some interest off of it. And it's, it's not for our purposes. It's for the discipline and the demonstration. I see a question about CDFIs. Yes. Um, should I answer that, Ruthie? Sure. This one is that there are no CDFIs that do social impact investing to Jewish nonprofits. So that model. So I wonder if the person who's saying that um, can clarify for me what kinds of nonprofits we're talking about. I'm I'm going to guess it's things that are overtly Jewish. But but why would they not make loans to things that are overtly Jewish? I don't understand. What what kinds of things do they provide these nonprofits? What kinds of things are they engaged in? I'm going to guess if if the person out here religious and Jewish cultural organizations. Okay. So the issue with that is, go back, it hasn't got to do with CDFIs. This is more fundamental. This is the question of whether financing is relevant. Go back to my very, very first slide, and maybe, I don't know if I can go, Ruthie, if I, I can figure out how to do it. The one but if we the go, double? No, if we go all the way back, one of the preconditions here is this is um, only going to be relevant where there's earned revenue, Right? Now, if it's a cultural organization like a theater that has earned revenue, and there's certainly I, I know someone that I grew up with who runs a theater company, and it's a very overtly Jewish-themed um, theater company, there's absolutely no reason that they couldn't get loans from a CDFI to build a facility, uh, to get working capital loan like I was talking about. So I think it's important to focus not on the religious designation of the work, but what is the activity 
of that enterprise? And is it an activity for which financing and investment may be needed either episodically to build a building or on an ongoing basis to provide other kinds of capital um, or expansion capital? So I can think of lots of cultural organizations um, of every uh, denomination and type that do need to build buildings. And that is a perfect thing uh, for a CDFI to assist with if the organization is not sufficiently resourced and scaled to the level that it would be attractive to conventional lenders. So, um, it, but it, if you wanted to just give it money uh, for, um, you know, just j basic operations, um, and there's no way for that money to be paid back because let's say it's an advocacy group uh, or it's a group doing educational um, programming and it doesn't really charge meaningful um, fees because that's not consistent with its mission, then financing is really not the right tool. The right tool might be a grant. Um, so I think the, the starting point is not um, – because I, and I can just say in my housing work, we have every uh, religious denomination I can imagine represented within our portfolio, and some I had never even known about until we started working in that field. Um, and I do know that there are uh, Jewish organizations that are very involved in providing housing and other kinds of services um, in their communities. And again, if they're operating facilities, if they're building things, um, and if they're running things that have contracts with state agencies that provide them uh, reimbursement for services rendered. They often need, again, uh, working capital, and they often need uh, uh, construction, financing for construction. So I don't know, Wendy is the person asking that question. Um, does that, is that at all um, helpful to you? Wendy, I hope that's helpful. There, we have a few more minutes if anyone has any more questions. You're welcome. I'm saying you're welcome to Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting format. <laughs> yes. Sorry, we did a lot of people on the call. I've, I'll give it about one more minute in case anyone is typing questions. Um, do you yeah, I'm happy to them? stay on right until 1130. So. Thank you. And I have also, in the meantime, if you look on your screen, you'll see the upcoming webinars that we have. And we will have this, the recording of this webinar available on our website as a resource. So if you want to go over things, and if anyone would like the deck, uh, please email me at ruthie, R-U-T-H-I-E, at jfunders.org, and I can shoot it over to you. Yeah, I think at the, you know, I, and I do apologize because I know with the format and because we wanted to leave time for the Q&A, went very, very quickly because um, this is a much deeper and richer conversation. And I think this last exchange just reminds me it's really, really important. Again, I want to emphasize a couple things. You know, start with the problem at hand that you're working on. You know, you have an organization or a particular cause or a particular uh, population you're trying to assist. And you want to think about and analyze and say, what is it that is um, challenging for that? For the, what is blocking the achievement of that impact? You know, um, and is there a relevant um, need for financing for resources that go to the organization and then are paid back? Um, and sometimes there is, and sometimes there's not. And if there is a reason to do financing, the next question is, is this financing something that the organization can get without us? Can they just walk to a regular bank or a regular venture capital investor and get the financing? Because if they can, there's no reason for you to do that with a PRI. There might be an excellent reason for you to do that with an MRI. And that's the distinction. Um, the PRI is something where there's a reason that capital is somehow not making it to the organization in the form that it's needed. And MRI is more where you're making an affirmative choice to say, we really want to invest in a way that is aligned with our values. And so you may be looking at a much, much wider array of things uh, there that you're not necessarily bridging a gap, uh, but you are making sure that your investments connect to the things you're interested in. 
um, and that might be companies that are located in parts of the world that you're interested in, and it might be, um, again, companies or businesses that you think are doing business in a way uh, that aligns with your values, or companies or businesses that um, uh, are producing goods and services that you feel um, really advance um, the goals of your uh, mission. Those are the two big fundamental differences. PRIs, as I think of as much more sort of deeply problem-solving kinds of capital, more risk-taking, more flexible. MRIs is more looking at the full spectrum um, of conventionally available investments, again, prudent investments, and making them uh, in an affirmative way as well as screening out things that you find um, you know, run counter to your vision and values. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you really want to start with what's the mission, what's the problem we're working on, is financing the right tool, and in what ways, um, and how can we use this to broaden out the toolbox um, in our institution so that in addition to making grants, we can also provide resources that allow organizations um, to test themselves, build a track record, attract other financing resources, grow over time, scale up perhaps beyond the scope of what's possible with philanthropic dollars alone. And I think as the world becomes full of more and more diverse models of organizations that do operate in kind of a hybrid at the juncture of mission and money, you know, in hybrid and blurring the lines between public and private and philanthropic and nonprofit, um, the ability to have this tool in your box, um, while it might seem more complicated, um, also expands uh, the range of, of what you can what you can do um, as a mission driven uh, donor or funder or donor advised fund. Um, I'll just leave by saying uh, we're really grateful for this opportunity to talk with all of you and to share what uh, we have been able to on this webinar. And uh, stay tuned because we are actively working right now on some new kinds of impact investments that we're designing specifically to allow others who may not have the capacity in-house or may not find it useful or appropriate to build that capacity to really become uh, not just a, a, a making, not to just make investments that advance our own foundation interests, but to become a partner in helping others make the PRIs and MRIs that they're seeking um, to originate. So that's coming, and more on that. We have a couple of pilots underway, and we'll be talking about that uh, more and more in, in coming months. Deborah, thank you so much for this very informative webinar. I'm sure already that people are going to be listening to go over some of what you've taught us. And I look forward to hearing what your foundation is going to be doing next and sharing resources with our group also. And if anyone has any questions or wants to, me to forward questions to Deborah, please email them to me, and I'd be happy to forward them over. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Deborah, thank okay. you so much for taking the time. Thank to you, this. Ruthie. It was a pleasure. Everyone have thank a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.